All right, Sony A6400. There's the flip screen. Should you upgrade from the Sony A6300 or should you consider downgrading? Is it a downgrade from the 6500? Who's buying this camera? Am I buying this camera? I own a 6500. You're looking at it right now. I'm going to talk to you all about the A6400 for video. Does this do pictures? Yeah, it does great pictures. Pretty much all of these cameras do great pictures because I know you're going to ask in the comments, but the focus here on my channel is video only. That's what I do with these. So what about the 6400? What did we get? Well, we finally got the flip screen. Ever since the A5100, we've been wanting a flip screen on the Sony mirrorless series. They've finally listened and they've given it to us. A lot of people have been complaining that the flip up screen blocks the cold shoe or hot shoe where you put a camera mounted little shotgun microphone. So you can't see the screen when you are vlogging or filming like this. So this was an issue I covered with the Canon M6 and there's a lot of solutions. Check out the comments for that specific camera, but I have a cage for my 6500. It's very affordable. It's 20 something dollars and it simply puts the mic cold shoe over to the side and it doesn't create a problem. Small Rig, the same company that makes my cage actually came out with a specific super thin bracket that does the same thing for I think less than $20. So it's really a non-issue. And for me, I do care about how the camera looks in line. I want a setup that is very compact. I mean, it's one of the reasons you buy Sony mirrorless is because they're really small and they're easy to carry around, they're easy to travel with, especially if you're gonna do something like vlogging. Of course, there is a lot smaller, but everything you get out of these cameras and then combined with their size, make them super attractive. It's one of the reasons I went from Canon to Sony. But I am not complaining because we got the flip screen and there are solutions to putting a microphone somewhere else around the camera. We're good. Keep putting flip screens. I'll be happy. I am going to extremely miss it when I go back to my 6500, have to put the camera out in front of me like this and just hope I'm getting the shot. That takes me to autofocus. The autofocus is already so good on these cameras. The A6500 does a great job. Most of the time I can confidently vlog without seeing the screen. I have a wide angle lens. You're seeing the Sigma 16 millimeter, which is my current favorite lens. On the 6400, most of the shots you're seeing came out of this, essentially this kit lens that B&H loaned to me. I asked for this camera to be sent to me so I could review it. You've probably seen all the reviews at this point. So these are just my experiences with this camera for the last month and what I think of it. But with a wide angle lens, you can easily go out handheld and vlog and know that you're going to be composed in the shot. Also going back to the idea of having a microphone with your camera, which I think you should have some microphone. It sounds better than almost any built-in camera microphone, almost always, <laughs> wait, always. This has a mic input, of course, all the other models have had a mic input, but the A5100, the last one to have the flip screen, did not have a mic input. And that's why for me, in that case, it really was a deal breaker. It's a great camera. It has overheating issues. I'm gonna talk about that here. But the mic input inclusion always brought me up to something like an A6300. I got in at the 6500. So I am recording right now with the Rode VideoMic Pro on the microphone, but I have this Tascam DL10. I think that's what it is. Everything is in the description, but I've got the lav mic on. You're now hearing the Rode mic, and then I'll also let you hear the onboard mic. You're hearing the mic that is on the front of the 6400. The record levels are at 17 on the A6400. You're hearing the mic that is on the front. All right, now the Rode Video Mic Pro is attached to the top of the 6400. The setting on the internal preamp, the setting on the mic input of the Sony A6400, I bumped that all the way down to 10 from the 17, which is good. You wanna be able to run those preamps as low as you can so you get the best quality. So this being a vlog camera, it has those two major things for me when I'm considering a camera for a vlogging style format, flip screen, and a mic input. Beyond that, going back to autofocus, 
This improves upon it even further so it makes the 6400 even better in terms of autofocus. It's still an auto feature. It's going to miss, it's going to not be perfect, but it is really good. For video, what you have is really good face tracking. And if there's not a face present, it'll go to an object tracking mode, or you can tap the LCD to select object tracking and it'll stick pretty well onto that object. Now, unlike the 6500, all you have to do on this is touch the screen and it's ready for the object tracking mode. Whereas you had to do the center lock AF option on the 6500 and it only worked okay. This is basically just integrated into the autofocus system and it works really well. And I really love how it sort of has a fallback system where it's sort of tracking something, prioritizing something that is important to the scene. In this case, it would be my face. And then if I looked away, it would switch from my face to then tracking an object like my head so it wouldn't lose the focus. So it does a fantastic job. I don't think you're getting eye autofocus in video mode. That would be cool. Maybe it's integrating it somehow. I don't think so. That's something for the comments. Let me know if you know different. We'll work it out. So with the microphone moved to the front, forward facing, more vlog friendly. First thing you should do is cut these off, by the way. They're terrible. But since this is going back, I have to leave them on. The one big feature that it's missing that the 6500 has is the IBIS, in-body image stabilization. So if your lens is not, Sony labels it OSS, optical steady shot, if you don't have that, then you essentially have no image stabilization. This is the way it's been most of the time. We're just now getting the sort of IBIS in a lot of these different mirrorless cameras. Panasonic series does this really well. I think their autofocus is probably not as good. So which one's more important? Again, you can add an OSS lens and it takes care of that. The 6500 has it built in. I've got the 16 millimeter on the 6500 right now. Of course, it's on a tripod, so it doesn't matter. In fact, you want to turn the stabilization off when you're on a tripod, but it allows me to put any lens that I want, like the 16 millimeter on the 6500 and have stabilization. So a vlogging camera that doesn't have stabilization built in is it really a vlogging camera? Well, again, you get an OSS lens, it's not a big deal. You're gonna pay less for this camera, a couple hundred to a few hundred dollars less depending on where you buy it, depending on where you live. So people are saying, well, you can invest that into a gimbal. I don't think gimbals are really a practical solution for vlogs, but you can do it. Of course, they look great, but it is a big piece of gear. Or you pick an OSS lens. Now. The options are less in an OSS lens. Again, I think the 16 millimeter is my favorite and I couldn't use it on 6400. So it would be harder for me to buy this because I'd lose some capability that I have now in the 6500. But in terms of vlogging, this camera is completely capable of doing it. But let me say a word or two about IBIS and not having IBIS, that in-body image stabilization. Here's the thing about IBIS and vlogging. Typically what you think image stabilization is going to do for you on these cameras is that you're going to be able to walk and have everything be stable. Honestly, I think you need to buy a small chip camera if you want, at least at this point, a camera that isn't connected to a gimbal to be super smooth. Something like a GoPro 7, which is built to almost basically look as good or better than being on a gimbal. So that's a very specific look. People comment all the time on my videos when I'm walking and I'm vlogging, that it's still shaky. Yeah, I'm walking. <laughs> it has that look, I'm vlogging, I'm walking. You know I'm walking, it's not terrible. And these cameras are a little dangerous because they have jello cam. The sensor creates that jello-like look in your footage if you're not careful. And these cams, this one did not get any better. They're still really bad. You just have to know that and be careful with it. So maybe the IBIS helps a little bit with that. So for me, what IBIS does is it removes jitter. That's the biggest thing. The tiny micro movements that happen when you're hand holding the camera, no matter how still you are, how good you are at holding the camera, there will be a micro shake known as jitter. That's most of what I'm expecting out of an image stabilized lens or a built-in stabilization system like IBIS into the camera. It takes care of that. That is key because that is what looks bad. It looks amateurish. It just doesn't look good. That's distracting. So the main move is that IBIS or OSS is going to remove that jitter. But not having IBIS, if you aren't into Sony yet, you don't have a bunch of lenses 
or you're looking to move to Sony or you're getting your first camera, this would be a great option and I wouldn't worry about the lack of IBIS. Again, most of the time I've been shooting videos, I haven't had that. I just bought image stabilized lenses. So your first lens would be a lens with OSS in it. All right, that's a lot of information on just flip screens and vlogging. What else we have? Internally, this has a new processor, an upgraded processor from the 6500. And in my case, for video, I think it's important because you get a lot of things because of that. So this is definitely an upgrade to the 6300. It's not so much more than the 6300 that if you're weighing the two, I would tell you to go for the 6400 because there's enough features that have been brought to the 6400 over the 6300. If you have a 6500 or you're looking at the 6500, instead of this, it's a few hundred dollars more, almost just for IBIS, that's the big difference. I would probably go with this. And I don't think it's a downgrade because you can get an OSS lens. So it's kind of an upgrade to both systems. That flip screen is huge. But the processor in this is in the Sony A9. I don't know if it's in the A7 III. Cameras that are two, three, four times more than this camera, the processor is in there. Now, the sensor is the same. So in terms of quality, the image coming out of the 6400 is going to look the same as the 6500. Uh, probably the 6300, I didn't have that one, but they're all the same sensor. So your image, we're not talking about an increase in quality per se, but what the processor does for us is several cool things. First up, overheating. This has been an issue, the A5100, I did a review on that, and the comments were full of my camera overheats in a few minutes. For vlogging, it's not typically a problem because you're usually doing short shots. You know, you get a shot of where you're at, talk for a minute, take some B-roll, you're done. You don't have to do long record times. But doing something like YouTube, which I think these cameras are suited for as much as vlogging. I think if you're doing on a tripod like I'm doing, sitting in front of the camera for any kind of YouTube thing, this thing may be even better for that. It probably is. So it does a lot of things well. But the 5100 was not a good option for that because it would overheat. The 6300 improved on this. It still had its own overheating issues. The 6500, I was very concerned about this. So it took me about three cameras. I returned a couple because I ran long extensive tests and some of them would overheat. I was talking about overheating and got cut off because recording limit. The 6400 has no recording limit. That's huge. This used to be a thing because of taxes and what defined a video camera. That expired, 6400, because of the processor and the lack of the tax, can now do no limit recording. So because the processor reduces the heat, it's not as hot, and because there's no record limit, you can go as long as your battery and your SD card will last. Also, I added in a new light. It looks kind of cool to balance the tungsten on both sides. I forgot to put that out too, eh, whatever. So yay, I ran out of time. The good thing is I thought I lost all of it. So for overheating, that processor basically allows the 6400 not to overheat. It does depend on what conditions you're in. And that's great that it's basically been solved in these very small format cameras. So if you're shooting long format speeches, ceremonies, whatever, even YouTube, I'm obviously taking up way too much time here. Unlike my 6500, this will keep going. It's not gonna overheat. The 6500 doesn't overheat. It does a great job, but the 6400 does an even better job. And I don't have the recording limit that I just ran into. I'm already spoiled by this camera. I didn't even think about it. The upgraded processor also helps with that autofocus, which is why I don't think I'm probably going to see a firmware upgrade to the 6500 to get that autofocus, I think the processor is allowing um, that to happen. Another key thing is better battery. So these are tiny batteries. This might be the thing I dislike the most about the APS-C, the small format Sony mirrorless cameras, is the battery is super tiny. They've gone with the same battery because of the size, which is basically the same form factor as the 6300 and 6500, tiny differences. I prefer the grip on the 6500, but you won't notice it if you didn't have it. But these batteries just don't last. You have to take at least a minimum of two with you. So when you buy this camera, if you buy the camera, buy a spare battery so that you can at least have that in your pocket. That'll allow you to get out pretty much most of a day and do a vlog and not 
have to run out of battery and be stuck. So the new processor, even on a battery that's really bad, extends it by 20 or 30 minutes. That's a big upgrade to me for batteries that are so bad. So a lot of times I will leave the camera overnight, come back, switch it on, and it's already dead. So I've noticed it helps with that a little bit. I would still carry a spare. I'll take any improvement on the battery that I can get. It's impressive they can get that much more life out of it just from the processor and the same battery. So cool. And finally, with the new processor, the screen dimming. On the 6500, you can't affect the brightness of the screen when you're in 4K. If you're in direct sunlight, it's gonna be really hard to see your screen. I didn't have a huge problem with it. You have the viewfinder, so you can look in there if you need to, but you're going to do most of your work on the LCD. You can't even increase the brightness. The option is grayed out on the 6500, but on the 6400, you can bump it up by two, and that's almost enough as it is, but it has a sunny, weather setting and it's super bright you hit record on 4k it doesn't dim you're never gonna have an issue seeing anything so you can get that critical focus and see it on your screen but pretty much equally as important all the information the settings on your screen that's visible half the time that's what i actually need to be able to read so i'm turning into the shade looking down at my screen that or the viewfinder so that i can see my settings so while it didn't feel like a big deal it's very nice to have it and now I kind of need it. All right, what else? I guess for the 6300, it didn't have a touch screen. I didn't realize that until I watched a bunch of other reviews, just like you're doing. But the 6400 gives you a touch screen just like the 6500. Really, this is just for focus, but because you can do that focus tracking by touching, it's really cool. You're not gonna be able to navigate the menus. When you take a picture, you can swipe maybe, or zoom in. Uh, again, not a review for a camera that does pictures, even though it does it well. But the touchscreen primarily in video is for touch to focus and it works really good. This is an option I've been using since the Canon 70D and I wouldn't want to go backwards on that. So I'm glad that if you're coming from a 6300, it is a nice upgrade. Time lapse is built in. This probably also goes to them billing this as a vlogging camera. I think that they're just using Casey Neistat as their model for vlogging would be my guess. Makes sense. And his videos always have a time lapse in it. So you're seeing that in a ton of other vloggers' videos, but it's also really cool. I wanna be able to have that option. With my Canon, I used to have a third-party intervalometer connected, and it was a big pain. On the previous Sonys, they had the app that lets you buy a time-lapse app, and there's all kinds of different things you could do, then they got rid of it. Time-lapse is built in. Now, I've done a video on s and which is slow and quick motion, which is essentially like time-lapse. It allows you to create a time-lapse in-camera on the 6500, but the quality is not good. This is going to be done via the images. Now you do need to switch to the images. I thought it was in the video. Switch over to images, set the intervalometer for the settings that you want, and you can shoot a time-lapse like this of me setting up the studio for this shoot. Slow motion, already great on the 6500. You have the same HD up to 120 frames per second at 1080, and this camera does a great job. That improved focus tracking is going to help um, because in slow motion, you really have to hit your focus and be able to track it because you can see it <laughs> in slow motion. So this camera also is great for slow motion, and that's the same as the 6500. The color is said to be improved, so most of the shots that you're seeing are shot with picture profile off. I don't have a picture profile turned on, so I'm just what you get straight out of the camera. Now, what you're seeing has probably been color corrected not color graded. So I have maybe made some changes to contrast and highlights and stuff like that just to get the image looking correct. But I didn't do a color grade. So the shots you're seeing are straight out of the camera with no picture profile. On the 6500, I love shooting S-Log2, but it is more difficult to work with. But does this camera look different in its basic no profile setting? Is the color science changed? They said that they have upgraded the color science. It definitely is more color, but I think from what I've seen, it's also more accurate in things like skin tones. So that's good. That is the thing I miss the most about Canon. The image straight out of the camera for skin tones and just in general, color-wise, looks better. That's what Canon's known for at this point, and that's the thing that separates them the most. And Sony has been sort of catching up with that, trying to get rid of that green tint. But the Sony image now looks pretty good. I think one of the reasons I went to Sony is it just has a different look um, also all the picture profiles that you get like S-Log. So it does lend itself to being 
I dare I say cinematic, it does have a different look, that's all I'll say. But the color has been improved. I don't know if it's drastic, but I'm glad that they're working on it and it continues to get better. Along with that, they've added in HLG, which is, I guess, some type of HDR profile? I don't know. It's basically like an S-Log that's gonna give you a really big dynamic range, except it's easier to work with. It looks like it has more contrast. So I played around with that a little bit. I would probably use HLG if I had it in my camera all the time, but for this test, I, again, I wanted to do a no picture profile, but it seems cool. It does seem easier to work with. It's not as flat as the S-Log. So whether I would use it permanently, I don't know. I definitely have to test it a lot longer. I still go back and forth. Right now you're seeing Cine 1 that I've tweaked a little bit on the 6500 and not S-Log 2. So I'm always trying different color profiles. Again, that's one of the reasons you get Sony is in many cases to have access to all those different profiles. So the HLG in here has, it's HLG, HLG 1, 2, and I think 3. There's a bunch of versions of it. They're all a little different. I think I found HLG 1 to be the most favorable in terms of dynamic range, contrast, you know, and protecting the highlights, basically dynamic range. But I don't know, mess with it if you get the camera for sure. Low light, again, the sensor is the same. The processor doesn't seem to help with that. These cameras still do great in low light. I've had surprising results with S-Log 2 in low light, but again, it's something you'd wanna mess with. I'm also trying profiles with more contrast in low light. So the shadows aren't as hard to keep clean. But people are generally saying, pretty much up to 6,400. I don't care how high the ISO goes. This one goes up higher. I think this one's like 25.6 on the 6,500. This one's like 32,000. All that tells me is maybe the processor, the sensor, the software, just because it can do more, maybe it does a little bit better at 6,400 than the other one. But I'm not seeing any real differences. It still gets pretty wonky and soft and grainy when you get anything over maybe 3,200, definitely 6,400, but that's a lot of ISO. So with a lens that has a good aperture, you're gonna get good low light results. You still need light, that's the key. Make sure whatever you're shooting still has some light on it. And it's the noise in the rest of the image that you can kind of control. When you expose for the thing that you're shooting for, that is lit. I'd sort of related to S-Log and picture profiles, really S-Log, is that when you're in auto ISO on the 6400, it doesn't just say auto. It actually shows you what your ISO is. As a camera reviewer, this is really cool for me because, because when I go back over the footage, sometimes I really need to know that instead of just auto. However, while having the information is good, again, probably just to people like me who do reviews, it's nice to see it on the screen for anybody, but you could always dial in a limit to your ISO for the auto settings. So when you go to auto ISO, I always limit that to whatever I'm willing to push my ISO to. So maybe 6400. So my camera will never go above 6400 in auto mode. So having the information there wasn't an issue for me in terms of quality out of the camera, but it is very cool instead of just saying auto, you actually know. But set your limits. You could always do that. That one I'm hoping does come to the 6500, because again, I could use it. A couple other software, firmware features of the 6400 that I tried to mess with, but again, in the comments, let me know if you've discovered how to do these things or how they work. Proxy recording. So really good in practice, you can set this to record proxies. Obviously, it's gonna take up more. Am I still recording? <laughs> you can set this to record proxies, which means Typically, this is a file you would create in the edit because your computer can't handle the 4K. A lot of computers can't. We don't have these super, a lot of people don't have super beefed up computers that can just tear through 4K video. A proxy recording lets you smoothly edit your footage, but it's a pain having to create additional proxy files. Well, now there's a setting to do proxy while you're recording the video. I don't know how this works because I guess maybe it's baked into the file that you create because I didn't see any extra 1287.20 proxy files that it says in the XML information that it recorded it. So if you just switch on proxy like in Premiere, is that activating some type of proxy that is baked into the image? I don't know. They don't tell you where these proxy files really are in the comments if you know, if you figure this out. But I like it, it's there. I just need to know exactly how it works. 
but this is a huge advantage. I love being able to record it alongside with the 4K footage. It's gonna make a big difference in editing and the time savings. Also, another really cool thing, auto white balance lock. So if you're in auto white balance, you don't typically wanna do that because if, especially if you're outside, the clouds are gonna move, the colors are going to shift. And then your footage, if you're vlogging, you're out walking along, is shifting colors all the time. Well now, because auto white balance is really good, I like how these cameras know what the white balance should be. I find that to be really helpful. Even if I'm just checking it, I'm gonna do a video about that. Once you switch it to auto white balance, give it a second, it'll figure it out, and then you can lock that. I couldn't tell if this was working. So, because the manual didn't make it quite clear, if you're watching, still watching this deep, you probably have dug into this camera. You may have this camera, let me know. All these cameras, most cameras, most DSLRs that I've used have a wind filter in it. This is just a low cut filter. On this one I noticed when I engaged it, it's really cutting out a lot of the low end frequency. So unless you were using the built-in microphone, uh, maybe an attached microphone, you didn't have extra protection on the microphone, and you were in a really windy spot, only then would I consider it. I don't find it to be much of a solution. It might just help a little bit, but your dialogue will suffer if you engage that. I would just leave it off. You can do it in post-production. All right, so I hope I've covered. I've covered way too much. This video is way too long. There's too much to say. Like Sony gives you so many options, which you'll find in the menu and get lost. Oh, the menu's a little improved. You get a custom page. I live on the function menu, which is right here with the FN button. I can get almost all the settings I want right there through the function menu. You will get lost in these. Sony's not known for their menus. They keep improving on it. But I think most of the reason this is a problem is because Sony gives you so much. Who's buying this? Is this your first camera? If you don't have a DSLR or you're not in mirrorless, yeah, absolutely, get this camera. It's a great price, has a ton of features internally and externally with the flip screen. You can do all the things you want to do. This is a super good entry point into, you know, nice larger chip sensor cameras. This is APS-C, it's not full frame, but the results are amazing. If you have a 6300, if you could sell that at a decent price, then it would cut the price out of this. It would be an upgrade for sure. So I would consider it. But remember, your image is not necessarily gonna get any better. So you could keep your 6300 and produce the same results. This just has features like a flip screen, touch screen, stuff like that, that's gonna make using the 6300, well 6400, a more pleasurable experience. So if you have a 6300, you probably don't need to upgrade unless you just really want to. If you have a 6500, like I do, I'm not gonna be buying this, even though it's going to kill me to not have the flip screen, I really want that. I don't do a ton of logging once in a while. Again, I can do it on 6500. The quality's not gonna go up. And IBIS for me, because I've already bought lenses that don't have OSS and I love the 16 millimeter Sigma so much, that I wouldn't want to give up IBIS. If I did not have the 6500, if I was getting into Sony at this point and I was thinking 64 or 65, I would probably almost certainly go 6400. Um, I love IBIS as an option and, it's, and I think it should be on all cameras going forward. It does increase the price, but 6400 has the things that I was looking for when I made the switch from Canon, mostly the flip screen. That was a huge sacrifice. So, so if I wasn't in Sony already, I would get the 6400. If I was going from Canon to Sony, 6400. You know, if you're looking in that price range, crop sensor camera, yeah, 6400. Huge fan, I like it. I don't really have any limitations other than not having IBIS, which I've already said is not really a deal breaker in this case because of the lens selection you can make to compensate for it. Yeah, I'd get it. All right, despite this enormously long video, you probably still have questions Maybe you're still deciding, you need to know something I didn't cover. Ask them in the comments. I will answer as fast as possible. Subscribe would be cool. See you next time.